I run one of the most in-depth TIG welding programs online. And after teaching hundreds of students in the program, I've learned a lot about how to get people going when they're first learning how to TIG weld. When people are on my website first checking what my program is all about, I still get emails from people like this all the time. Hey Dusty, I just bought a TIG welder for myself and I need help. Turns out it's way harder than it looks. Thanks. Totally understandable, it's all good. Let's go over some things to be aware of right now as you are first getting going with TIG welding. Essentially, the main thing that people need to be aware of, honestly, is how difficult this process is to learn. What we are after is a refined and specific control of all the variables that we are learning. So for example, we want perfect cleanliness. This is honestly a detail that is surprisingly difficult when somebody first gets going with TIG welding. Learning how to prepare our material, our filler material, as well as keeping a clean and functioning torch. This something that surprises a lot of people. Shiny passes that look like a stack of dimes. This takes a lot of practice before you're gonna get results like this. When we're running passes, we want a controlled and consistent shape to everything we're doing. Working on flat stuff for exercises is difficult enough, but trying to practice and work on a difficult joint and trying to keep a consistent profile from start to finish. Once again, this is pretty difficult to learn. Consistency to your overall stepping distance. When people get this detail down, that's when things start to look really awesome and look like a robot did it. But once again, this takes time. Getting consistency to all the variables that I've just mentioned here is absolutely something that's best learned from the bottom up. Without a proper understanding of the basic fundamentals, this is gonna make for a really long learning curve. Let's go over a few common hangups that get people stuck when they first give this a try. And obviously, how we can work around them to keep you excited and motivated to learn. And seriously, be sure to stick around for the last one. That's one detail that more people need to talk about. All right, first up here. We talked about this one briefly at the beginning, but this is super, super important. And that issue is cleanliness. When people first get set up to start running lines and their stuff looks like this, oh my gosh, don't freak out. We'll get you sorted out. A lot of the time I have seen people go through extensive processes of cleaning the material they're working on, as well as cleaning the filler material they're working with, scrubbing away at everything, thinking that might be the problem. And honestly, a lot of the time, all it is is a torch that is not put together properly or has a contaminated tungsten electrode. When we're putting our torch together, we have multiple pieces that need to fit together perfectly. All these pieces need to form an airtight seal. This has to deliver a clean and consistent gas flow to your welding area. Any one of these tiny little fittings isn't done up properly or has been put together in the wrong order or one tiny little fitting hasn't seated correctly. Unfortunately, you're gonna get stuff that looks like this. Some of the first things in my office online TIG welding program teaches somebody no matter what torch they have at home. It's gonna teach them how it works, it's gonna teach them how to assemble it correctly, how to maintain it so they can get clean stuff, and most importantly, how to troubleshoot this first thing when we're first getting off the ground with the most fundamental exercises. What does your tungstone look like? Tungstone? Damn, autocorrect got me. Tungsten, what does your tungsten look like? Is it mashed up and dirty? Has your balance been set incorrectly? So after a few welding passes, the end of your tungsten looks like this? You need to swap it out immediately. Learn how to clean a tungsten properly and how to set your machine up to get better results with keeping the shape of the tungsten the way you want it. Once again, my students, they start out simple, figuring out what type of preparation they prefer and how to set things up properly and then maintain it. If one of these tiny factors is not put together correctly, no matter how much acetone you use or how much you wire brush your stuff, these weld passes are going to look like a flaming dumpster. Do not start practicing until you have learned and confirmed this step. Do not waste all of your hard work and time spent practicing when it's something so simple we could have taken care of right at the beginning. All right, next one, number two. This one is so important. I love seeing people getting excited and wanting to try TIG welding. But when you start out trying to learn on joints like this, buckle up things are gonna get really frustrating. Starting out on stuff like this can also lead to a lot of discouraging experiences when somebody first gets going with TIG welding. Trying to learn advanced joints or plate configurations. When you are first learning how to TIG weld, this is essentially like buying your first pair of boxing gloves and then going to fight Mike Tyson right away. You're gonna have a bad time. To get to the level where we can then work on advanced shapes and controlling passes as they go around different profiles or plate configurations that are a little bit more challenging. This it takes a lot of work to confidently get up to this point. When students are working through the lessons and exercises in my online TIG welding program,
program, they honestly don't start welding any kind of joint until like the fifth or sixth welding lesson. And that's just a welding lesson. We have like seven lessons of other stuff that comes before that. So working our way through a bunch of basic stuff first. Are you starting to see a theme here? When I am teaching somebody, I'm building them up from an absolutely basic understanding of what we want, how to have the best attempts at trying some of this stuff, and most importantly, what we can do to learn best from the work that we see as we practice. You're honestly probably not gonna get lucky and throw down perfect passes every time. Some people do get good results when they first start, but there's no context to realize why certain things are working, and what happens when they get off track trying to try it on different stuff. I've been doing TIG welding for like two decades now, and honestly, I still cannot get things perfect all the time. Just read my comment section. We can for sure get really close sometimes, but most people have to stop and take a good look at what they're doing and identify things to correct and chase down further for when they practice next time. I always try and teach people the most simple stuff first because by the time they get to the more challenging stuff later down the road, they are able to troubleshoot their own work and break down their stuff much quicker. And when they do so, they're gonna have a much better understanding of how to navigate and work through some of these challenges. Like I said, the issue of cleanliness and any kind of torch or gas problem is essentially gonna be non-existent by this point. Again, working from earlier exercises, when they sit down to practice, they should be head down working away. On specific techniques of what we're working on at this point, there shouldn't be any challenges or surprises as they work their way into more challenging stuff. I always say when somebody jumps ahead to the next lesson in the program, when they're working on a new joint, it should not be difficult, it should only be different. Taking things that we learned earlier on in a more simple scenario and then applying it to the next step makes way more sense. All right, this next one honestly is something that doesn't get talked about a lot. And in my opinion, it's really something that people need to be aware of when they're first getting going with TIG welding and especially when they're first looking for equipment to purchase. You do not need to buy fancy gear. There we go, I said it. Today, we are fortunate to be at a current moment in the industry. Anybody can get hooked up with an absolutely killer machine and delivered straight to your door. High quality inverter type machines capable of AC and DC TIG welding. And even some of these setups you can get set up right out of a standard wall socket. Always do your research on that before you buy anything. Huge disclaimer here. When it comes to gear, you can get high quality aerospace stuff, rad helmets with crystal clear vision. We got gloves and other kinds of PPE that other professionals use. You can get high quality gas delivery systems for your torch. They also look cool as hell as well. It's way too tempting for me to bust out the credit card these days and get all kinds of sick looking stuff for the setup that I have here, but listen, there are some things that you need to get good looking stuff as you are learning and I'm gonna save you some money ahead of time here and tell you that those things actually isn't really that much. Part of my program that each student goes through is show them how to use whatever setup they have access to, whether at a shop where they work at or something like that after hours or something that they've scored for their shop at home. No matter what somebody's set up with, they're gonna learn how to set it up properly and begin using it from basic exercises. I have some students working with giant transformer type machines huge, bulky, uncomfortable torches, air-cooled setups that get super hot in your hand, and accessories that are essentially just meant to get the job done. Again, it's all good. Everybody has different setups. Even though some of them are pretty basic, it's all good. But you know what? Even people with the most crazy setups in the world end up doing awesome. You do not need to spend money on expensive and flashy gear when you're first getting going. Getting a good quality machine is 100% pretty important, but again, you do not need to go out and buy a big name brand. I mean, honestly, those brands are sweet and those machines are a ton of fun to use. Everybody here has watched me on my YouTube channel for years use pretty much simple, basic machines that I just know how to set up really well. Add a few accessories here and there to make things a lot easier for myself. Even when I first bought the machines and gear for this studio when I first started my YouTube channel, I was tempted to go out and buy a Miller or something really nice like that, but instead I just wanted something I could set up properly and get going from there. Buying a really expensive machine or something like that, it's kind of like buying fancy golf clubs and gear. I have a ton of friends who buy the nicest golf stuff, the most expensive shoes and all the accessories, and clubs that cost more than a paycheck that I would earn. And you know what? Even with the nicest stuff that they can buy in the store, they still golf like shit. Shout out to you, Roger. 
<laughs> it's awesome to have nice stuff, but if you are learning the fundamentals of welding from the bottom up and understanding the processes of where to start and how to strategically work your way to the next step, you do not need fancy stuff. I used to work in a shop where I used a enormous transformer machine. This thing had virtually no advanced settings on it. Most of the other guys in the shop had Millers, fancy dynasty machines. And you know what? If I took my time working my way through a project, setting it up properly and working my way through it strategically, not bragging or nothing, but I usually had some pretty awesome looking stuff. At least in my opinion, I did. But an old clunky machine outdoing some of the most up-to-date technology, it's honestly just a thorough understanding of the process at this point and how to strategically work your way into anything that you're doing. I see people using the nicest machines. And like I said, when I see them looking at the tungsten that they're using or a cup that's supplying the gas, it usually looks like this. Essentially, this is like having a Ferrari or something like that and only driving it with like two tires on the rims. No matter how nice the gear you have, if this one important thing in your torch is not set up correctly, you are going to get stuck and get frustrated. And unfortunately, you're not even gonna know what the cause of this problem is. This episode goes over not only how I teach people to deal with this stuff, but how I deal with it. Because even still, to this day, I still smash my tungsten and have all kinds of problems I have to sort out sometimes. Happens to the best of us. So check that episode out next. It's super, super important. Do a random act of kindness for a stranger today. Pacific Arctic Welding, my name is Dusty. Phil and Chill, we will talk soon. Peace.